Hey everyone, Mike here with the sysadmin school. And every sysadmin has their own set of tools that they keep in their toolbox. And by tools, I'm really meaning software that I keep on my computer or at least on a USB drive. Every sysadmin has their own list. I wanna give you my list and I wanna introduce you to maybe a couple tools that you may not have heard of before, but I find very beneficial in my day-to-day -day job. So we're gonna do, this is gonna be a countdown. These are gonna be in the order of how I like these tools and probably how much I actually use most of these tools. So we're gonna start with my number 10 and that is Rufus. If you've never heard of Rufus, Rufus is a piece of software free to download and pretty much all of these tools are free that I'm gonna list here. But it's a tool you can download for free and it is for creating bootable USB drives. You basically can take any ISO you want that is bootable and you can write it with Rufus to a USB drive. Now the cool thing about Rufus, and this is where I really like it, is as operating systems have changed and as BIOSes have changed and hardware has changed, we've gone over now to the EFI versus the old BIOS systems. And Rufus will work with both of them. Rufus will actually work with either a BIOS computer or a EFI computer in terms of creating the bootable USB drive. So I really use this a lot when I'm creating physical USB drives for server installations or for workstation or desktop installations. It's great. It, I really love it really for Linux is my big, my big favorite about it. And again, it works with pretty much any ISO you download. The next one is number nine, Procmon. Now Procmon is a sysinternals tool that is owned, created by Microsoft. Again, completely free and you can download it from Microsoft's website. It shows real-time file system registry process and thread information. This is really cool if you're trying to determine what a specific application is doing on a computer. You can see every time that application accesses the registry, accesses a file, or creates some other process or thread. So this is a really good troubleshooting tool if you're trying to determine what exactly an application is doing. I've used it in the past to determine what permissions I needed to give an application. When the vendor gives you an application and says, oh yeah, that, that application needs to be a local administrator on the computer, you can take this program and be like, no, it really just needs access to this registry key, this registry key, this file system, and that's it, which is great. So it can really also help with security along with troubleshooting. Number eight, RSAT tools. Now the RSAT tools are again made by Microsoft and they're specifically made for managing different Microsoft softwares. So we've got the Hyper-V management part of the tools, which is great for managing any Hyper-V server, failover cluster management, which is great for managing any sort of failover clustering. And then we have the whole entire suite of Active Directory tools. These are great tools because you can use them to completely do anything you want with your Active Directory environment. You can create new domains, you can set up child domains, you can set up you know, uh, sibling domains, you can modify users and computers, you can modify DNS, you can DHCP, the list just kind of goes on, but these are tools that every sysadmin needs to have under their belt and understand how to use. Number seven, remote desktop. This, I, it's number seven for me, but I use it daily. I use it multiple times a day because it is really the way that most sysadmins connect into a server. It's how we connect into a server to configure it, whether we're configuring IIS, whether we're configuring file shares or other stuff on a server, it's most how most sysadmins connect in. Now, it's used a lot, but it's getting, it's gonna be used less and less as we migrate and start moving stuff more to server core where we don't have that desktop environment. So remote desktop is literally logging into a server and being right there on the server desktop. It's also great for troubleshooting because you can be right there on the server and get a feel for how it's performing. Number six, Notepad++. Now, if you haven't have heard of this program, it's also a great, again, free program that you can download from their website. Not Microsoft, but the developers of Notepad++. The reason I prefer this over Notepad that just comes in Windows is Notepad++ has the ability to color code text for you. This is awesome if you're looking at, say, an XML document or an HTML document or even a JavaScript or a VB script or PowerShell document. 
it will color code stuff that it recognizes for you and it just makes it so much easier to read. The other reason I really like it is because it can open extremely large text files super quick. Notepad can sit there and hang and may even crash if you try to open up a one or two gig text file. I know that's a huge text file, but Notepad++ handles it like a champ. It has no problem opening those text files and it has a really decent search feature where I can literally search the entire document and it will give me an index of where everything I searched for is in the document. So Notepad++ is a great one. Most people have probably heard of it because it's pretty popular. I even have used it for development work in terms of writing HTML, CSS, and JavaScript with it. So again, great, completely free tool that you can download and use. Number five, Nmap. Now, a lot of people, when they think of Nmap, they think of security, they think of penetration testing, but Nmap can actually be a great tool for sysadmins to use. If you know the command line properly, you can immediately initiate just a quick ping sweep of an entire subnet and get a quick idea of what servers are online. This can be great if you don't have something like a PA or like a uh, IP address management system. I was trying to think of the name of one of them. The one I use is PHP IPAM, which is not in this list, but should probably be. Um, but it's a great way if you don't have an IP address management system like that, you can use Nmap to do a quick sweep of a subnet and get back all of the operating or all of the computers or devices that are online in that subnet. What I really love using it for is doing a port scan on a specific server. Now, over the years, the the rules have changed and you know servers a lot of times didn't have firewalls and when they did have firewalls, they were disabled by sysadmins because they just caused more headache. And then even more over the years now, firewalls are remaining turned on and breaks a lot of things if you actually try to turn the firewall off on a server. So Nmap is great when you are setting up specific ports and you want to make sure that the traffic is being allowed to the firewall. Great example is if you don't say use IS, say you use a well, you can use IS, whether you use IS or Apache on a server, and you know you think you've added that exception to the firewall to allow port 443 through, but it's not working. So now is it my web server that's not working or is the firewall actually blocking the traffic? I can use Nmap to scan for port 443 on that server and tell me whether it's listening or not. And if it's listening, I know my firewall is configured correctly, and now I need to look at you know either my Apache setup or my IIS setup for the problem. Number four, Visual Studio Code. This is a great piece of software that actually came out, um, honestly, it's probably been a year or so now, and I absolutely love it. It's Microsoft's free uh, IDE for developers and it's cross-platform. So it will work on Windows, Linux, or Macintosh. And it's great because I mean, of course I use it on Windows and Linux, I don't use a Mac, but it's great to use the same kind of platform no matter which computer, whether I'm on my Windows computer or my Linux computer, it's nice to use the same platform. And it's again, free, it's a free IDE, unlike their Visual Studio, uh, their full package, and they had Visual Studio Express, but it still, it, to me, was bloated. It was very bloated for someone like me who was writing scripts or was writing very small programs. I didn't need an IDE that was as powerful as Visual Studio. Introduce Visual Studio Code. It's a great download right from Microsoft's website, and it also supports plugins, which is really great because now I can add a plugin if I'm doing, say, Node.js, programming, if I'm doing PowerShell scripts, if I'm doing C-sharp programming, pretty much anything I'm doing, there's a plugin for it to help me with it. And it'll even add plugins for helping me auto-complete code that I'm working on. So it will actually look at the code and help auto-complete commands. It, really what I use it for is HTML for websites that I do, and I use it for PowerShell scripts. Pretty much all of my PowerShell scripting now is done through Visual Studio Code. And the other reason is because of the built-in PowerShell command. You have a terminal there that you can actually execute multiple terminals within the Visual Studio Code window of multiple instances of PowerShell. And I can just do everything I want from right there. Now, they used to have one called ICE, uh, Integrated Scripting Environment, I ISE, which came on pretty much every operating every version of Windows. And it was great. It's, a, it's great, and I used it quite a bit. However, there's... 
there's just more flexibility with Visual Studio Code because it has this ability of plugins and you can get plugins from Microsoft, you can get third party plugins, there's all types of plugins and it just works better for me and I really enjoy it. Number three, PuTTY. So if you're not familiar with PuTTY, pretty much anyone who's been in IT for any amount of time is familiar with the program PuTTY. But PuTTY is a TTY. It's basically a way of uh, connecting via serial cable, via SSH or Telnet, or even our log on, login to some sort of device. If you're a sysadmin or a network admin, you need to have this in your toolbox. And the great thing about PuTTY is it's portable. So there's no actual install for it. You download the PuTTY program and that's it. You have the PuTTY program, you can put it on a USB drive and any computer you go to, you now have PuTTY with you. Actually, for a long time, I kept it on a tiny USB drive that stuck on my keychain, on my keys. So no matter where I was, if I was at work and I didn't have my computer with me, I could just stick that USB drive in, launch PuTTY, and I could access, say, a switch, a router, a Linux server, any of those things that would use SSH. Now, again, the other piece that's to that is it supports serial connections. So if I'm configuring, say, a Cisco switch for the very first time and it doesn't have a network set up, I need to plug in and connect via serial port. This is great. So PuTTY supports all of that, and that's why, to me, it's number three. The other reason that I love PuTTY is you can actually script it. So you can script out PuTTY commands, have it connect to a server, and issue a list of commands that you have in a text file. So quick story about how I know this and why I like this is because I had an issue years ago, this was probably nine, 10 years ago, with a Cisco switch where the memcache was, or the cache on it was filling up. And when it would fill up, it would basically not accept any more connections. And it was a bug that Cisco recognized and they were gonna RMA the switch, but we had we didn't have four hour support. We had SmartNet, but it was like SmartNet next day. So they had a switch coming the next day. However, the switch was a switch used by guests. It was used by hotel guests who, you know, were connected to the internet, most time for business, sometimes for pleasure, but they were connected to the internet and they needed that switch to work and I didn't have a spare. So what I did was I created a script that basically issued the commands on the switch to clear the cache. And then I created a batch file that would launch PuTTY connecting to this switch and executing the commands in my text file. And then I set that up on a scheduled task to run every hour. So every hour for the next 24 hours until the new, until the new switch arrived, I had a PuTTY script automatically logging in clearing the cache and logging out. And I had no issues. I let it run all night and I never received one call, one complaint of anybody having a problem because that cache was getting cleared every hour automatically. And this is why I love PuTTY is being able to do stuff like that, being able to automate some tasks like that, make PuTTY a very powerful program. Number two, PowerShell. PowerShell, and this again is, it kind of goes back to Visual Studio Code, but PowerShell built into every version of Windows now is so powerful, hence the name PowerShell. But it is a great program. It's, again, built into Windows. It is really Microsoft's, if you don't know about PowerShell, you really should read up on it, but it's Microsoft's punch to combat against Bash. Bash is an incredibly powerful command line scripting language that Linux has had for years. And now PowerShell, with PowerShell, you can do everything. Now, Microsoft writes stuff pretty much nowadays and last over the last few years since PowerShell was kind of introduced, their methodology for writing software was every functionality for that software has to be within PowerShell. Any configuration, that kind of stuff, has to be written in PowerShell, and then it can be ported over into the graphical interface. So by doing that, by giving you every configuration option, everything within PowerShell, it is just amazing the fact that you can now, again, automate everything. I'm huge on automation. I think it's silly that we spend so much time doing tasks, that doing the same task repeatedly. 
And if we can capture that pattern and we understand that pattern and we're doing the same task every time, we need to automate that task. That task needs to be automated because we're just wasting our time that we can be spending on other things. And PowerShell gives us the, the ability to do that with a lot of stuff. It gives the ability pretty much anything PowerShell can integrate with. And PowerShell even now has the ability to call web APIs. So everything's going into a RESTful API now where it's just, it's just HTTP GET and POST requests, really input and deletes. So the fact that PowerShell can do that and tie into that makes it basically means we can automate just about anything, pretty, pretty much just about anything. And a, another quick story about this is Kemp uh, Load Balancers. Anyone who knows me knows that I absolutely love Kemp Load Balancers. They're a great load balancer for the price. And they're a very strong product. I've used them extensively over the years. I even created a course a long time ago on some older versions of them. And they're great. They're a great hardware load balancer that you can get virtual or you can get physical actual equipment. They have a web API. They're, you can actually interact with their uh, load balancers programmatically through their API. Now their API is what, again, it's called a REST full API. So it's just HTTP, get posts, puts, and deletes to do different functions. Because PowerShell can access that web API and can use that web API means that we can do everything with PowerShell. And I actually, a number of years ago, wrote an entire PowerShell module for Kemp load balancers. And it was great. I could drain out servers. I could create virtual services. I could completely configure an entire Kemp load balancer without ever having to actually log into the web interface, which again, great. And all of that be through the power of PowerShell. I'm gonna say power, see how many times I can say power in this video, but PowerShell, my number two. And lastly, number one, and this I'm gonna have some probably controversy over, but it has just proven itself so useful in so many different areas, Wireshark. Wireshark is a, again, completely free network analyzing program. It is a piece of software that you install on a computer and that software will monitor whatever network devices you or whatever network adapters, there's the word I was looking for, you have set up on that computer. And you basically click start and any traffic that goes across that network adapter, Wireshark will pick up and then you can analyze it. And it's absolutely amazing because of what you can do with it. Now, it basically gives you layers one, two, three, and four of the OSI model within it. And it kind of lays each packet that you capture out that way as well. So why do I love this so much? It's because it has proven so invaluable or so valuable to me for many different reasons. One is troubleshooting. I use it pretty much anytime there is an issue of stuff that goes across the network, I'm doing a Wireshark trace. I'm doing a Wireshark trace of SMB shares. I'm doing a Wireshark trace of VoIP traffic. Anytime there's an issue of something going across the network, I'm doing Wireshark traces. I'll do a Wireshark trace on one side of a firewall, and I'll do a Wireshark trace on the other side of the firewall, and we'll see if the traffic actually gets through. Again, valuable. So, and it's also to me the kind of, there's no questioning it. When I take a Wireshark trace of a problem and I go to a vendor and the vendor says, oh, we're not, that's not our problem. And I say, look at this trace, look at this Wireshark trace here. This traffic is wrong. That's your problem. They can't argue with it. So that's why I love Wireshark is because it kind of is a great equalizer. It's, you can't deny the information within a Wireshark trace because it is what is actually captured. I'm checking out my notes here at the bottom. One of the other things that I've done with it and done incredibly successfully and worked, and it really works very well for, is VoIP traffic. And I mentioned that a little while ago, but you can Wireshark with the built-in tools, you can completely rebuild an entire voice over IP phone call with audio. This again, to me, has become incredibly valuable because I've been able to take calls where people have reported problems, been able to rebuild the entire call and determine where the problem was. 
Was the problem something in my equipment? Or was the problem something in our telco's equipment? Where was that problem? And I can see that within the Wireshark trace. I can see where packets were dropped coming from the telco to us. Or I can see where we were trying to talk to one of our servers and getting a failed response back or getting no response back. So it really, really helps to pinpoint where your problem within a network may be if you're having a problem. It's just such a great troubleshooting tool. And there's just so much you can do with it. I have actually another quick story is I have, I, I built these boxes a long time ago and I'm, I need to improve on them, but I call them sniffer boxes is what I call them. And they're really just tiny form factor computers that have two network adapters, one for management, one for sniffing. And basically you boot the thing up. I created, it's a Linux box. I created a service that automatically launches Wireshark or T-Shark, which is the command line version of Wireshark. Uh, comes with Wireshark, but basically it launches T-Shark looking on the other network adapter, and then it just runs. And then I have scheduled tasks that basically, or cron jobs, because it's a Linux box, that every day at 2 a.m. it stops the T-Shark service, it compresses all the capture files, it moves them to a directory of the previous day's date, then it goes through, and anything that's older than 30 days, it removes that folder. So basically what I end up getting is I get, when I log into this tool, I get a folder structure of 30 days worth of compressed Wireshark traces that I can pull back at any time and pull stuff out of. So these are really cool boxes that I built and I've got an entire doc on how I built them and how I went through the process of it. Um, but they're really cool boxes that literally do nothing but sniff traffic. You can just, you literally could take them and just put them in different points of your network and you could sniff the traffic and, and consolidate them and look at them if there was a problem later. There's just so much you can do with Wireshark. I could probably do an entire video just on Wireshark, but I'm not. I'm going to kind of kill it here because Wireshark is my number one tool that I think every sysadmin should have and be familiar with. If I didn't mention, it's also free. So there you have it. That is my list of my top 10 tools for my toolbox. Now again, these are all software-based tools. I may do a video later on with some actual physical tools you'd hold in your hand. But for now, this is my top 10 list. And who knows, in a year or two, there may be something new out and I may have a different list. Like I said, Visual Studio Code wasn't on my list two years ago, but it's definitely in my list now of software that I think every sysadmin should have. And it's definitely one that I have on every computer I own pretty much. So that's it. I'd love to hear what you think, what you have in your toolbox, what you think are better tools. Um, and I'd love to know if you actually haven't heard of any of these tools. If there's any tools that I listed that you've never heard of or want to know more about, let me know. Leave me a comment down below. If you're not watching this, if you're watching this on YouTube, check out my site at thesysadminschool.com. I try to give you every information, all the information you need to be a successful sysadmin if that's where you would like to go in your career. Also, feel free to follow me on Twitter. My handle is Mike Walton, 1984 And with that, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did and you're watching this on YouTube, I'd love a like. Um, if you, Again, if it's beneficial, feel free to subscribe, and I hope to have another one soon. Peace.